In this installment of our Getting Started with Rail Clone course, we're going to explain the A2S generator and create a building style. Before we get to that though, we'll use simple markers to try and explain as clearly as possible how this powerful node works. In essence, the A2S or 2D generator is a stack or a series of rows of 1D generators. In fact, many of the same settings are present in both generators, including parameters for evenly settings, corners, default modes and more. Where there is repetition, I won't go over that topic again in detail in this tutorial. So the first thing to understand is that the 2D generator is built on the X, Y axis. And as you can see here, any segments you use should also be aligned to work on this axis. It just makes things a bit easier. When making buildings though, this can mean you need to lay your parts down flat in a way that feels a little counterintuitive. Anyway, let's create a rail clone object and explore what options the A2S generator gives us. So we'll create a new rail clone object and go to the modify panel. Open style editor. Create a new array 2s generator and then add a spline node. We'll define the size of the x spline by picking a line from the scene and wiring it to the x spline input. Then we'll do the same to define the size on the y axis. Now we'll add some segments, so we'll bring in a single segment and then immediately go to clone multiple and bring in all those markers. This is a really quick way of loading multiple segments. Now we'll start to build up the array from the bottom. So here we can see we can target the bottom left hand side of the array, the bottom right hand side of the array, and then we can fill in in between by wiring geometry to the bottom input. As you can see, this is like the linear generator. But we've got multiple rows, so we can do the same thing for the top. So for example, we can target the start top, the end top, and then we can fill in in between those two markers by wiring a segment to the top input. So between these two rows, we've got a gap. And this row here repeats on the y-axis multiple times. It's defined using the start input, which you can see adds one to the left there, the end input, which hits the other side, and then to fill in the gap in the middle, we use the default. So now we have a 2D array. But of course, if you remember from the 1D array, we've got multiple other inputs we can use, and those are present on the 2D array too. So one of them is to be able to target corners where you've put vertices on the X spline. Now, just like the 1D array, you've got several corner options, including the ability to bevel the corner. You've also got default segment options, including different distribution modes like adaptive. As I mentioned, I'm not going to go over these again in detail since we've covered them in a previous lesson. So just like the 1D array, we've also got the ability to place regularly spaced intervals using the X evenly input. Once again, you've got the same sorts of settings here, so we can change the distance and we can change the mode. Unique to the 2D array is you've also got the ability to do this on the Y axis, which has its own settings. Now these settings are pretty much the same as the X evenly input, so we don't really need to go over them in too much detail. One thing though is that both of these have this extend to side option and that lets you control whether the row or the column can continue through to the top or the side of the array. You can do the same thing with the corner input. So there are a couple of other newish inputs in RailClone. This lets you place geometry by applying markers directly to the base spline. So wire them into the graph and then we'll go to the spline and add an RC spline modifier. Using this, you can add markers that create new rows or columns of geometry. Here you can see, for example, by putting an RC spline modifier on the X spline, I can add a marker that creates a new column. If I go to the Y spline and add an RC spline modifier, I can add markers that add new rows and I can control them with these markers to save me from having to add additional vertices which might change the shape of my original spline in ways that I don't want. These markers have their own section here but as you can see there aren't very many options and specifically there aren't options for extend to side. That's because the X and Y markers take the settings used for the evenly inputs. So these two things are synced 
If the Y evenly input extends to the side, then so does the Y marker. You also have the ability to add padding, just like the linear generator. So we can add padding to the start end, top and the bottom. If we wanted to make this up by like a building, all we need to do is just to turn the spline around and you can see that the array follows the orientation of the Y spline. Alternatively, if you don't want to use the spline, you can disconnect it and you can just set a measurement instead. But here you can see you're restricted to the spline laying down on the XY axis. So how would you turn it up in the case for building? Well, what you do then is you'd use the X rotation property. So in the generators general tab, go to X rotation and enter 90 degrees and that rotates your array to the Z axis. Other settings in here are Y mode. And to illustrate that, we'll turn the array flat again and I'm going to take the original X spline and I'm going to make it curved. So I'm going to change the vertex type to smooth and just give it a bit of a bend. Another little tip here, you can see that this isn't deforming very well, it's a little bit jaggy. One way of getting around that is to go to the style rollout and increase the curve steps parameter, which automatically smooths out that spline without you having to go back into the base object. So now we'll change Y mode to free and now each row is calculated independently whereas in aligned mode each row is calculated in relation to the original one so in that way the columns line up. In free mode the columns don't line up because each row is calculated according to its new length. We've also got clipping options. So if we create a new rectangle and then go back into the graph, we can use that to cut a hole through this array. So we just drag in a spline node, pick our rectangle from the scene, and immediately you'll see it cuts out and leaves only what's inside the rectangle. You can invert that by changing the mode to exclude and then it keeps everything that's outside the rectangle. You can also change the projection. So at the moment we're projecting on the Z, but you could choose X or Y too. You'll see there's a no slice option and that's when you have slice turned off for a segment like this. You have several options on what to do with that. So you can either preserve it, you can retain it, or you can just force slicing irrespective of what you've set that as. There's also a free option which basically turns off clipping for that particular segment. Another really interesting setting is extend XY size to area. In this mode, you don't need to define the size of the array using splines or measurements. Instead, it takes its size from the clipping spline. It basically makes the array large enough to fill that clipping spline. You can see, as I change the size of the clipping spline, the array is automatically rescaling to make sure that it perfectly fits. You can rotate the array within that spline and it will rescale the array to make sure it fits with the new orientation. We'll just turn slice on again. So there we go, you can see that's working perfectly. There's also an expand option which slightly enlarges the size of the array bigger than the dipping spline. This can be useful if you find you've got little gaps being created by a pattern at the edges of your clipping. What though if your spline isn't flat? You see the array remains flat on the XY plane. How can you get around that? Well, that's why you use the auto align option. So X to XY will align the bottom of the array to the bottom most edge of the spline. Or you can use to spline mode, which uses the vertex numbering to decide which of the sides should be used to orient the array. You can see that if I go in here and change which of these vertices is first, the array will rotate accordingly. That's okay if this spline doesn't have any holes, but what if we have a spline which has a subspline inside it? You can see in that case the outer spline is used to add the geometry and the inner spline is used to cut it away. If you change hierarchy checking mode to none, each one of those separate splines will be used to create an array, so it basically ignores the hierarchy. You can also change it to by material ID. 
This is a way of giving Rail Clone a helping hand to understand which of these splines should be considered as part of the same hierarchy and which should be considered separately. So here for example, by giving that subspline a different material ID from the larger spline, it creates two separate arrays. Whereas if I make a copy of it and set the material ID of the subspline so that it's the same as the larger spline, you can see that one cuts a hole. In this way you can create quite complicated and sophisticated clipping operations. There's also a cap holes option which will automatically fill in any open edges for you. So now that we've got the basics of how the A2S generator works, let's apply that theory to a real style and create a building generator. So we've got our building pieces and as you can see they're upright as you would logically expect them to be. But now that we know that we build the around the X, Y axis we have to lay them down flat and then reset the X-forms. Now we're ready to start building the style. So we'll open a new rail clone object, open the style editor and create a 2D array. I'm going to add a spline node, wire it to the X spline input and then pick a base spline from the scene. I've just got a straight spline here just to start with to keep it simple. For the Y size, I'm going to set a dimension. I'm going to set it to 20 meters, start wiring in the segments. So for now, I will just pick the start and wire it to the start input. This is the start of the bottom floor. So I'm going to the start bottom and the end bottom. I'm just going to change the alignment Z axis to pivot so that everything snaps together correctly. Now that we've done that, we can clone multiple and bring in all the other pieces of the facade. Just organize these pieces in a way that's a little bit more logical for this demonstration. And we'll start putting it together. So let's take the ground floor and wire it for a randomized operator into the bottom input. Change the default mode to adaptive so that only whole segments are used, no slicing. That's the ground floor done. Just like we did in the demo, I'm going to add the top row. So I'm going to take the segment for the top and add it to the start and the end. Take the top facade and wire it to the top input. As you can see, we've got the top and the bottom. And if I adjust the height, the top, as you'd imagine, goes up on the Z axis. Now we can fill in between. So we'll do the start and the end. And then for the default segment, we're going to create a sequence rather than randomize it. So we'll take all of the default segments and wire them into a sequence. As you can see, that's working well. Now we'll take the start and the end and wire it to the X evenly input to add pillars. We we'll just need to change the distance to something a little bit larger. And what you'll start to see is that there's a bit of a problem because the pillars at the top and the bottom floors are too small. And yet there's no input for the top and the bottom evenly columns. So what you can do instead is use this macro. And what this does is it breaks out several more inputs for these rows. So now what I've got are inputs for the default, which I'll put the original segment in. But I've also got other inputs that lets me target the top and bottom of the evenly and the corner parts of the array. So you can see I can target the top and then I'll take this segment and I'll target the bottom. Now I've got appropriately sized pieces in those inputs and the whole building starting to come together. So let's change the spline so that we've got some corners and we can take this existing macro and wire it to the corner input. Now we've got pretty much a whole building. We can swap this spline and you can see we've got the same building but with curved corners. And that's the beauty of rail clones, incredibly powerful for creating these kinds of variations. We can even add a spline to define the Y axis. And I'll just wire this into the Y spline input. Don't forget, in order for this to work, I'll just need to reset that X rotation to zero because now I'm using a spline. With that done, I can easily change the height of the building using this spline instead. But perhaps more interestingly, I can also curve this spline to create double curved buildings. This would be very difficult to achieve using other techniques. One last thing. At the moment, the pattern 
of facade elements on this building is incrementing on the x-axis but when you use a 2d generator you also have the option of creating patterns on the y-axis instead now that we've set our building up it's very easy to adapt it to our scene so we'll just pick a new x spline next to our hero building and i'm going to change it back so that instead of using a y spline for the height it uses the y size instead so in order to do that, I'll disconnect the Y spline and I'll just change X rotation to 90 degrees again. If your camera remains below the roof of the building, then this style is perfectly fine. But as soon as you bring your camera up above the building height, you'll notice, of course, that there's no roof on the building. So in the next little tip, I'm going to show you how to cap the top of this building. And in order to do that, it's easier if we export the Y size value of the generator so that we control the height of the building from the properties panel and we can then reuse that value to put a cap on the building. Export the Y size and then add a new numeric node. Set the mode to scene units and wire it to the Y size input. You can then control the height of this building by going to the parameters rollout and changing the height. Now let's cap this top. So we'll create some geometry for the roof. In this case, I'm going to keep it simple and just use a plane. I'm going to go back to my graph and I'm going to add a 2D generator, a new one. I'm going to use the same X spline, but instead of wiring it to the X spline input, I'm going to attach it to the clipping area input. And then I'm going to import my roof geometry. Wire that to the default input. I'll just turn off the main building so we can just see the roof. Turn on extend Y size to area so that the roof geometry fills the clipping spline. But you can see of course that it's on the ground not on top of the roof and that's why we exported the height of that building because now what we can do is go to export parameters, go to geometry, Z offset and then wire the Z offset input to the building height. And if you want, you can do some fine adjustment by going to the segment itself and adjusting its said translation property. So that caps the building. We now have a complete building generator that we can use to populate the rest of the scene. If you want some variety, why not try and build a new generator with your own geometry to create a version of the scene that's uniquely yours. And remember, if you found this lesson useful, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any future installments.